Good afternoon. I am delighted to welcome you here to the Dis Dean's Distinguished Lecture in the Clinical Sciences. For those of you who I haven't met yet, um, my name is Katrina Armstrong, and I'm delighted to have joined this Columbia family about a week ago. I have to say one of the things I was looking forward to most about being here was the opportunity to participate in these events, to hear the science, to meet the faculty, and to be able to come together to learn together. I think as we know, that this is a really critical part of that for an academic center. So the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series was founded here at the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1981 really to provide us an opportunity to come together, to learn, to expand our horizons across what we each do. I shared with somebody the other day that one of my favorite articles is an article called The Strength of Weak Ties. I don't know if any of you have read it. George, have you ever read it? It's a wonderful article that I'd suggest that at some point you all find. It's an article by a sociologist named Mark Granovetter. Um, one of my favorite parts about the article is that it was actually his PhD thesis in sociology a long time ago, and he couldn't get it published. I think he had an enormously hard time actually even getting his PhD based on it. Um, it was eventually published. There's a saga to that. And it has now been cited, if you all were to Google it right now, it's now been cited almost 65,000 times. It's considered one of the top three articles in sociology ever published. It's really a network theory article, if you look at it. And what it showed was actually that the major leaps forward that we make are not from the people that we spend all of our time with. They're not from the person who's in our lab or who does exactly what we do. They're from somebody who is somewhat removed, who's what he calls a weak tie. He actually studied the labor market outside of Boston. And what he found was that people, if they're looking for a job, and I tell my kids this all the time with absolutely no effect, that the best jobs that you get are from the person who you meet, at, you know, who's the on the doorstep as you're going into a party or somebody's sister's aunt or however it works. And that it's that weak tie that actually gives us the greatest steps forward. Part of the reason it's been cited 65,000 or whatever it is times is because it turns out that that observation is true for so much. It's particularly true, it turns out, for science, that actually the way that we make novel observations, I think, Gerard, this morning you said that we test a hypothesis in a new way, is because we think outside of our box. We stretch and learn and bump into somebody else who's thinking about the world a different way. I just wanna say that I know that's hard. And I think for those of us carving out time to find a way to look and listen and learn differently is one of the hardest things in an academic enterprise. So that's a long way of saying why I was so excited to learn about this series that is specifically dedicated to those weak times. So how do we learn about something outside of what we do? that can change the way that we see something. It is also obviously a series that honors those individuals who've contributed so much to our academic endeavors. I think if you look at the people who have been um, awarded here in the past, it's truly extraordinary. I shared with somebody today that just joining this community, the strength of the scientific community here is fundamentally unparalleled. You can see that in the individuals, of course, in these lists of names, but you can see that in the accomplishments and the dialogue and the way that people take on problems. I will say that I was particularly delighted that today's lecture was Dr. George Ripsack. Not only is this just an extraordinarily well-deserved recognition of everything that you've accomplished, and I'll say a little bit about that, but I was particularly excited to be able to hear you talk. So to have this happen in the first week of my time here is like a gift. So George is the currently is the Vivian Beaumont Allen Professor of Biomedical Informatics, the chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics here, the director of the Medical Informatics Service, 
I'm not gonna go through his long list of training and accomplishments, it's separate to say that he made a really good decision in 1985 when he, I think, um, uh, well, he made a really good decision before 1985 when he came here to train in Madison. And so we are so incredibly fortunate that you did that and that you've been a part of this community ever since. George is an elected member of the National Academy, but I think, Part of what's just really amazing about his career is back to that weak tie argument is that he's just found ways to bring our understanding of how we can make observations, how we can learn about the world around us in really brilliant new ways. He's created in many ways this field of informatics um, about how we understand using data to create phenotypes how to develop new language and new syntax that can make sense of the complexity around us. He's found been a key part of finding and founding our way and using observational data through the observational health data sciences and informatics initiative that is just huge. I think it's across so many countries now is bringing together new ways to develop new methods for how we use natural language processing but I think fundamentally I was excited because he represents this idea that we all have that by making sense of the world around us, we're gonna find a better way to take care of our patients, to understand human biology and the human condition. And so it's just a magical thing, George. Thank you so much for doing this. And I'd like to invite you up and congratulate you on being this year's Dean's Distinguished Lecturer. Thank you so much, Katrina. Now, please excuse me. I just need to do for our external viewers. Are we good? Wow, thank you. Thank you all for coming in person. Thank you for you uh, behind the internet. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm gonna give you a whirlwind tour as usually I kind of speak quickly and go through a lot of slides usually several slides uh, you know, per second, it feels like sometimes, um, to build a story. And I'm gonna show you observational research from the vantage point of what, the work we've done at Columbia. Uh, the other thing I had to do. Okay. No financial disclosures. My team, who I very much appreciate, my lab on the left, our trainees, in the middle, my Odyssey collaborators, you'll hear about them. This is a small subset. And on the right, other collaborators on causal inference. Observational research, what is that? Subjects observed in the natural settings, often collected for other purposes like um, healthcare, also known as real world evidence, as opposed to experimental or randomized clinical trials. Some examples at Columbia, we have some of us have a license to the IBM Market Scan database with tens of millions of patients or the electronic health record at Columbia with 6 million patients and other sources traditionally like the census and new things like social media and census, sensors. So the US uh, healthcare uh, uh, industry is $4 trillion. NIH doesn't have the money to repeat the experiment. So we need to learn from our experience. When you order a drug, if you are a clinician, you ought to know its side effects. Right now, what we do is we know some side effects and we assume any we don't know or don't exist, but we don't have actually have evidence. So Patrick Ryan plotted for every drug um, on the market, every possible positive or negative effect of that drug. And where we had evidence, he put a red dot. And what we wanna see here is a red rectangle. So we have evidence on everything, but instead what we have is mostly red, a white rectangle. And it's worse than that because he had to multiply the red dots by a factor of 10, just so you could see them. Otherwise you wouldn't understand what I was talking about. So we need to fill in this rectangle. Why do we need a lot? We need a lot of patients to do this. Why would that be? Well, even with millions of patients, once you pick a disease, a subgroup, a drug, a side effect, you're down to a handful of patients. If we can increase that number to a billion patients, then we can do some real research and really fill in that previous square. But there's a catch. Observational research, when you write a paper, send it into a journal, they say you can't put any causal language. 
because there's fear of the uh, irreproducibility of observational research. So here's an example. Do bisphosphonates cause esophageal cancer? Well, let's do an experiment. We'll look at the UK database. Two groups looked at the same database for the same question, sent in their papers to BMJ and JAMA within a month of each other. One said yes, one said no. <clears throat> so now, you know, the public doesn't know what to do with this. Now, actually, if you look at the confidence intervals, maybe they're not far apart, but I can show you plenty of, you know, dire contradictions also. And then with COVID, we've seen retracted papers for a lot of reasons related to unreliable research. The result is um, editorials like this, where you say the magic of randomization versus the myth of real world evidence. So the green paragraph on the left says, you know, well, observational data are good for some things like for rare side effects, but otherwise the paragraph on the right says, we really should be using randomized trials instead. But that's a false comparison. We're not comparing observational research to randomized trials since we don't have the money to do all those randomized trials. Instead, uh, we need to compare it to expert opinion and instinct, which is what's happening in its absence. If you look at guidelines, they're mostly uh, expert opinion. I'm gonna be showing you an example of that later. So we need to optimize our observational research. Uh, this is a framework, Patrick Ryan put this together. Don't worry so much about the words on the left-hand side, because you can argue of which word goes where, but the bottom line is when you do an experiment, can you repeat it? Can someone else repeat on the same population? Can they repeat it on a similar population? Can they generalize it to other populations? And can they triangulate um, other methods and find the same answer? So I talked about other people, other researchers and other populations. So we're talking about a community with the advent of the internet, we have the ability to vastly improve our reliability and re observational research. So that uh, brought about the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics Initiative known as Odyssey, which came about, by the way, Katrina, via weak ties, just as you said, because that's how we met each other and created this initiative. Its mission is to improve health by empowering the community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care, multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary international collaborative coordinating center, Columbia University founded in uh, uh, 2014, based on an, an early initiative that was five years old. Here's the map of our collaborators. We now have about 2000 collaborators from 74 countries, uh, data in our, um, uh, federated database is about 800 million unique patients around the world. So much larger than the US population, about one tenth of the world population in our federated database, represented about 300 sites. Published about 344 papers with specific policy uh, effects that I'll show you later. Odyssey is an open science initiative that's open source software, but also sharing everything, protocols before we do the research, our diagnostics, our results, everything we do is open. How do you get a database of 800 million patients? You don't. What you do is you let them keep their database local. You have them converted to a common data model. So now they have a database. I share my question around the world. It's a voluntary network. They execute the query. They send the results back centrally. And then we collaboratively interpret the results and publish. And our papers tend to have a lot of authors, kind of like CERN in physics. What's a common data model? Well, you know, if you take your appliance and bring it around the world, it's hard to plug it in. You don't want to rewire it. So you bring an adapter so that you can plug in your appliance anywhere. And that's what a common data model is, like an adapter that converts the data that are local in whatever language to a common format that we can use from around the world. <clears throat> Here are the tables in the OMOP. It's known as the Odyssey common data model. It's meant to be simple. If you look at it, there are things like drug procedure, device measurement as a lab test, visit, and so on. So people can pick it up and use it quickly. We're going from around the world. So we have extensive vocabularies. And in fact, um, about 9 million concepts in our vocabulary taken from 153 different vocabularies. And every time you put data in, it's converted to a standard set, which is you, pretty much the US national standard with vocabularies, if you've ever heard of these things like SNOMED, ARCS, NORM, and LOINC. If you've ever done this work, you know, if you give someone a standard and they have to convert their data to it, give it to three people, you get three different versions out of it. So a lot of Odysseys work on the conventions to teach you how to do the conversion. So if you have like a death diagnosis, do you mean cancer, the chronic thing? Do you mean that their heart stopped or things in the middle? And then we supply a lot of tools so that you can, um, 
uh, help you convert your data, and then data quality tools to help you assess the quality of those data in the EHR. A lot of people have said the biggest benefit they've had from joining Odyssey is running these tools and finding out uh, that they had problems in their source systems, which they went then went back and fixed. <clears throat> if you have 9 million terms, and I just want to know, like I have a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, I need to find that term among the 9 million or set of terms. So we have tools to help you do that. We have tools to help you build cohorts, that is a set of patients that'll be involved in a study, then design the study using online tools. All of this is, again is open source, and then tools to visualize the results. Based on all this, we generate three kinds of evidence. So first is characterization or tallying, counting things. How often do different things happen? Uh, who takes metformin? Second, and this is like our core, is population level estimation or causality. Does metformin cause lactic acidosis? And third, prediction, what's the risk for this particular patient? I'm going to focus a little bit on the touch on the first and focus mainly on the second here. I'm going to take a brief diversion into phenotyping, which is informatics version of it. So when I teach the medical students, um, I show them this and I say, what does Perla mean? And they say, pupils equal round reactive to light in a combination. And I say, I didn't ask you what it stood for. I ask you what it means. And some of them kind of get it and start laughing. It's like, I means that I looked towards the patient and they had two eyes and I wrote down Perla in the chart. So I did a study. I said, how many, so now what's that a photo of? Someone with a prosthetic eye. So they only have one iris. They can't be equal in one eye. So I said, well, of our one-eyed peop people with a prosthetic eye in our database, how many are Perla on their, on their exam? So we did pretty well, only 2% are Perla on exam, uh, but another 8% were said to be Perla on the left or Perla on the right, which I understand what they mean, but it's a misuse of the term. So my point here is, it's not about the definition of the terms that go in, but what do they really mean? Data are mostly missing in the health record. First of all, we only sample people when they're sick, so we miss a lot of their physiology. And second, there's a lot of uh, pertinent negatives are, are left out, say when an attending writes a note. They're noisy. Um, some of the stuff is 90% accurate, but like, do you smoke is 50% accurate. That's the example there. And this is taken from an actual paragraph in the chart, 36 year old man, 27 year old woman in the same paragraph. It's complex. There are different times. These are times for a lab test. Generally, you have a number of times to choose from. None of them are the one you actually want. And then there's healthcare process bias, where it's a large feed forward network where we're making measurements, it's deciding therapy, then we're remeasuring, the patient's taking actions. So if we ask a question like, how are people's kidneys in the course of the day? You'd say, well, people get pretty sick kidneys at night. Why would that be? Because a naive study, you only measure people when they're sick at night, otherwise you'd wait till 9 a.m. So you need to know this healthcare process in order to interpret the data. But the good news is that doctors are successful in using the record and they do a good job. So we need to mimic the doctor's reasoning and kind of deconvolve the truth, just like you take a set of x-rays to create a CT scan. So we need to figure out the truth. So what we do is we create this middle thing, which is the phenotype between the raw data in the EHR and the correlations uh, or the analysis that we want to do. We have a middle thing called we call the phenotype. So for example, when we're trying to diagnose diabetes, we don't just look up the disease. We look at the medications, the glucoses, uh, mentions and notes and things like that. The problem is it can take months. Drug-induced liver injury took us six months to define that thing that it would work around the nation for one of our projects. So Odyssey has been working on improving that and making it faster and more reliable to create these phenotypes. And this is the Odyssey phenotyping pipeline. Now I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go through two examples from this. One is a project called Phoebe on Osteopolitz, getting the concepts right. We have this huge network around the world. Why don't we find out how often Every code happens in every database around the world. Let's just count it. And now I have this huge knowledge base and I can look and say, if I'm defining diabetes, you know, now I can have a feel for what they're calling it in Germany versus France. And we have this conversion between vocabularies, but it's imperfect. So we're able to use this to make suggestions that when you're defining a phenotype, it says, you know, also count these other people who I think, who this system thinks should be included that you might be missing. Second, one of the banes of phenotyping is the evaluation. You have to do a chart review to get the sensitivity. You would need to evaluate a thousand charts. Uh, so the fee value is an automated method that estimates the sensitivity and specificity without that large manual review. So this is a set of tools to help you do that task. Now coming back to Odyssey. So 
The first example I'm going to give you is our first large scale study characterization. Uh, what drugs do people actually take for diseases? We don't actually have that really recorded. We know like how many drugs get sold and we know what the guidelines are. It's a complex decision what drugs people take. So we said, let's go to this database. We had about 250 million in underlying population, five countries, 12 databases. Let's see how three chronic diseases are actually treated in practice. This was our first paper, large paper published in PNAS in 2016 summer. The key here is that this is a sunburst plot. The inner circle is the first drug. The second circle is the second drug and so on out. It goes up to 20 drugs, but those lines would be very thin. So we only see about three or four out. What we see here is for type 2 diabetes mellitus, 75% of people around the world are treated with metformin in keeping with the guideline. 29% of people start on metformin and in a three-year period, because that was what we were looking at, take only that drug, which means 45% at least try another drug, at least temporarily. So now let's look at uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, the first. So there were 12 databases. I'm showing only three for each group. The leftmost column, type 2 diabetes, we see the US database, the UK database, and on the bottom with the red arrow, the Japanese database. You see that they all give metformin, except Japan is only about a quarter metformin. So I thought it was maybe a data error or formulary thing or insurance. It turns out, according to diabetologists in Japan, is that they, clinicians believe that Japanese patients don't get insulin resistance and therefore metformin is not an ideal drug and they tend not to give it. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. South Korea, they look just like the US and Hong Kong looked just like the US, but Japan looked uniquely different. In the middle column is hypertension, still a lot of agreement. We see hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril, uh, but not as strong as the diabetes. And for depression on the right, complete disagreement on just three US databases. And that makes sense because we don't really know how to target drugs for depression by patient yet or side effects. One interesting finding, in this population of 250 million, of which I don't know, one or two million had hypertension, 25% of them, so you know, say 250,000 people, had a sequence of drugs in three years that no one else in the database had. So that's not following guidelines when 25%, like 250,000 people, each had a different trajectory of hypertension meds. So my conclusion is that it's feasible to encode a world population over 10% in a single data model. And that generating evidence is feasible. People were willing to share, and we were able to accommodate vast differences in privacy and research regulation. So now I'm going to turn to that main topic, population level estimation, causal inference, hypothesis testing. Odyssey's approach is to study it scientifically, to look at a distribution of study designs, distribution of parameters, databases, hypotheses, and get the operating characteristics of what we're doing. When you do a study, and you publish it, you're saying, look, I'm really good at this. And just trust me on this. I have a lot of experience. It looks pretty good. Look at my method section. We don't do that. We have diagnostics and we study the operating characteristics. So this slide is to interpret the next one. On the horizontal axis is the hazard ratio or odds ratio. It's the effect size. On the vertical axis is the uh, standard error. When you do this plot, everything in purple is not statistically significant. And the dashed line that you maybe can see is P equals 0.05. And then on the bottom in blue and in tan um, or green is uh, either harmful or beneficial. Let's take the literature. Let's parse 12,000 papers in the literature and take 30,000 estimates and plot them on the screen. And what do we get? 85% of them are positive. So we're missing the negative studies. So that's probably mostly publication bias the big problem is when you want to interpret a result, you need to know how many things were negative because there's these false positives mixed in there. By the definition of a p-value, 5% are false positive. If I don't know how many you did, I don't know how many are, are false positives. We also suspect something called p-value hacking. That's where um, you know your paper is not going to get published if it doesn't have a good p-value. You get a p-value of 0 0.052. Um, you say to your postdoc, you know, I think you're missing a variable, or I think this slightly different analysis, you redo it, your p-value is 0.049, which is not really different, but that's it. I knew that variable was going to be important in the study, and you publish that one. That's called p-value hacking. Some people have said that's not surprising because, you know, we're only studying the things we think are going to be positive. So if you take a cross-section across those graphs, you get the blue line. And what we see at p equals 0.05 is a cliff on both sides. 
if I actually know ahead of time what's going to be positive magically, the best I can do is the red line, which has a soft thing at 0.05. The only way you can achieve those cliffs if equals 0.05 is publication bias or other kinds of cheating. So while individuals may go do good research, observational research, in aggregate, the medical observational research system is basically a data dredging machine. So what does Odyssey do? One way to summarize it is to be verified and open. So verified means diagnostics at every step along the way to see how we've done in this study. And open means I have to share everything so I can't cheat. Uh, this is a summary of the next slide, which is the published version in Jamia, our journal, called the 10 Legend Principles, which is large scale evidence generation and evaluation across a network of databases. Instead of going through these 10, I'm gonna highlight five of them in the next uh, slides. <clears throat> So the first thing is we use something that we've developed called large scale propensity score adjustment. Rather than go through on this slide, I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper. So don't worry about this slide. So the big problem in observational research is confounding. Is something really causal or is it an association? So if I wanna study whether butane gas causes lung cancer, right? I would study, do an observational study, find everyone who's carrying butane gas around, which is butane lighters. And I'd find a lot of them get lung cancer and conclude it does. But there's a confounder there. Smoking causes you to carry that lighter, but it also causes to give you lung cancer. If I don't adjust for smoking, I'll get the wrong answer. So that's confounding. So we need to adjust for that kind of thing in our studies. Propensity score adjustment is something that was invented in the late 70s by Rubin. Um, a propensity score is the probability, and you're comparing two groups, the probability of being one group versus the other group. I use this score to balance the two populations. I'd really like to do a randomized trial. Flipping a coin helps me balance or lets me balance it. Using propensity scores is a, is a way of approximating that uh, by knowing that score and then matching the two populations so they are approximately equal. Uh, the problem is I got to identify what to put into that propensity score. I need to find the confounders. And the standard right now is manual selection of confounders. Well, one of the standards, manual selection of confounders. So in some of the studies that I'll be showing you in a minute, I looked at the literature and said, well, let's find the confounders. And when you read one of these papers, they say, I found the confounders, here they are. And this is what I believe. And I have very smart people who tell me these are the right ones. If you then compare studies of the same hypothesis, everyone picks a different set of confounders, right? So there isn't good agreement. When you, do, when you try to pick 20 things a human being, you know you're going to miss one and include one. A second approach is to be empirical and get it from the data, have the data teach you which are the confounders. We actually do a third thing from this, and I'll, I'm going to compare to that in a moment. I won't go into too much detail because that would be an hour talk in itself. <clears throat> we do large scale propensity score adjustment. We actually say, I'm not going to pick the confounders. I'm going to adjust for everything in the database. So in the electronic health records, I have on the order of 10 to 100,000 variables. I'm going to correct for all of them. Okay. But then a causal inference person will warn you, well, you don't want to balance everything. There are these other variables you need to avoid. And so because it's not an hour long lecture on this part, I'm just going to state what we do without explaining it. And then I'll come back to reality. There are mediators. We avoid them through pretreatment variables. There are simple colliders. We meet, we avoid them through, again, through pretreatment variables. There are instruments. We do that through diagnostics and domain knowledge. And there are complex structures that people always quote, but I'm not sure that ever really exist. But we, have, we address that through correlation uh, with the underlying causes of that structure. Okay, so that part aside. So we do think of the, I just wanna, my point in saying this is that at least we think about this, okay? Then we fit this model. Uh, we use something called a regularized regression, a lasso. We do that because we have many more variables than cases. And then we create a sample that's balanced. And we check if it's balanced. Now, those of you who know regression and lasso know that it kind of reduces the number of variables, but we check our balance on every single variable. So here's our diagnostic. Remember, we put about 50,000 variables in it. The plot here on the horizontal axis is, was, was how was the balance before we did this propensity adjustment? The gold standard, and these are uh, standardized mean differences. The gold standard is less than point, less than or equal to one, uh, point 0.1. And what we see on the bottom axis is before we did this fixing, this was an unbalanced sample. And we have numbers over 0.2. After matching, everything's under 0.1, everything's under 0.05, and most of it's under 0.025.
But I didn't just check a small number of variables. I checked everything that wasn't excluded because they were mediators, instruments, or something else. And then I also look at equipoise. The thing is, if, you're, if, you're, if your two groups are very different, I can create balance by getting rid of the different ones. The problem with that is that I'm less generalizable. I may be getting rid of the very patients I wanna treat. So since I lose generalizability, if my equipoise is not strong, it's still internally valid, like it's still causal, but it may be causal on people I don't cause about, I care about. So it's not generalizable. So that's a caution. So it's another diagnostic we use. Now here's the one that's gonna get me in bigger trouble. So now you say, well, what if I didn't measure the confounders? What do I do then? And you, every paper says, well, there could always be unmeasured confounding. Well, we believe that some confounders are not directly measured, but may be correlated with those 100,000 variables that we did include. So we did this hypertension study I'll show you in a moment. And baseline blood pressure is an important confounder for hypertension. It affects the treatment and the outcome. But it's not measured in most of our databases. But it is measured in one of them. And we found that we did the LSPS balance uh, without blood pressure. So in that one database where we knew the blood pressure secretly, we ran the algorithm without it and found that it almost, but didn't, unfortunately not quite, almost balanced the blood pressure. And then when we did the study with and without blood pressure on the right-hand graph, all those different hypotheses had almost identical confidence intervals. So we're finding that that blood pressure, even though our database, we didn't include any vital signs or anything like it, was able to balance blood pressure between the two groups. So we said, well, how far does it go? Let's try for throwing away every diagnosis and just balance on the medications. It works perfectly. Let's try throwing away all the medications and balancing only on the diagnoses. It almost works. It was off by eight variables did not, were not perfectly balanced. But actually they were very close to being balanced. What if we take away everything that has anything to do with cardiovascular disease, the drugs, the medications, everything. Balance on the others, everything in cardiovascular disease ends up balanced at the end of it. But if we do a small set, like just the demographics, then it doesn't work at all. Um, study by uh, Lin Ying Zhang, actually her work was more on the theoretical basis of this, but I didn't have time to show it all, but I'll show you the outcome of the, of the, of the real thing we did afterwards. So we said, let's take the uh, union of all those confounders I showed you on the previous slide and use that as a manual selection. And let's compare that to LSPS. And let's put in or take away an important confounder, which is blood pressure. I mean, uh, the type two diabetes. If you take type two diabetes away from the manual confounders, if you miss one, it does very badly. But if I do manual with diabetes or LSPS with or without diabetes, it works all the same. So we're finding that this is kind of working. Outside groups have looked at it too, or separate groups from our core and found that compared to manual, LSPS versus manual seem to work better. LSPS versus the other, that empirical thing I referred to earlier, HDPS, also work better. So we do all that and we say, I still don't believe it. There's probably still confounding left. So let's find, have another diagnostic for confounding or any other bias that may arise. <clears throat> Negative controls are where you come up with a hypothesis that's similar to the one you're studying but where you believe there's no effect. And this is becoming more and more popular. You publish a paper and you pick one or two or three negative controls and show that it's negative there. The problem with that is one negative control is an anecdote, not a demonstration. So Odyssey picks 50 to 100 negative controls and creates a distribution of negative controls and then generates a diagnostic. So on that previous graph I showed you, I plot the same points and I see if they're negative controls, then by the definition of a p-value, 5% should be false positive, should show up as positive. In this, and sometimes we get like 60% positive, and then you know something's wrong with your study. There's something funny going on. I mean, you may get some of your negative controls wrong, but you don't get 60% of them wrong. In this study, 16% were, uh, were positive, so something's a little bit wrong. One thing we've done is calibration p-value or confidence interval calibration. That is, you widen your confidence intervals a little bit to turn your nominal type one error to 5% instead of 16%. So we cheat a little bit. We make our confidence intervals a little bit wider so that our, we get a 5% that we're looking for, but there's no free lunch on this. It means we're gonna lose some true positive uh, results that we would have had. So you can decide, do you just wanna use it as diagnostic or do you wanna do calibration? Third uh, thing we do is multiple databases, multiple locations, multiple practice types to make sure that the 
internal validity that databases that are similar are consistent checking generalizability or databases that are different how close are they we combine them with meta-analysis you know we had a recent grant review where we got faulted because we were using multiple databases and they said you know really better to use one database because you have multiple you're going to see that they disagree with each other as if not knowing that there's disagreement in the databases is better like you should be putting your head in the sand rather than knowing the truth Four I've already talked about, publish all hypotheses, pre-specified protocols, code, parameters, runs, everything. Another argument we've had, we've literally argued, you should share all your source code. And we've had the argument back, not just that it's unnecessary, but that it's harmful to share your source code because you'll confuse your readers and reduce your reliability. So you wanna hide your source code and just uh, tell them what it does. One of those people sells source code, but. And then uh, we not only do many negative controls, we do many hypotheses. Even if we're studying one hypothesis, we'll do many hypotheses around it, again, to assess the operating characteristics of our uh, methods. So on the lower left is the plot I showed you before. And in the middle is the plot that we get. This is a study of, of side effects of depression drugs. And what we see is 11% are positive. And this is calibrated, so we know the 5% is about right. So it means 5% are false positives and 6% are true positives. It means when I publish a finding with this method, with all this care, I have a positive predictive value of 55%. So I, I'm getting it right 55% of the time. It means that the literature shown in the lower left, it's positive predictive value for a new finding that you don't really suspect is probably like in the 10 or 20% range. So people say, well, you're generating all these hypotheses, you have multiple hypotheses, you're going to get it all wrong, you're, you're data dredging. We generate a lot of estimates, then you decide what your question is, and you correct for that. If you have one hypothesis, you just use our result. If you look at our database, show me something positive, then you'd, yes, you'd have to correct for all our hypotheses. What we do is not data dredging, because data dredging is not what you do, but it's what you hide. That's what creates data dredging, and that's what the literature is through publication bias. So now let me show you um, putting this into action. So this legend study in hypertension, there's the US Hypertension Guideline 2017, um, about 58 drugs, half of them first line, half of them second line, not a lot of information of which ones to pick among those. Uh, there are 40 randomized trials that were relevant to this. The circle, um, there's a circle of dots. Each dot is one of the drugs, first or second line. Each arc means we have a randomized trial, head-to-head -head comparison. As you can see from that, it's mostly empty. Most decisions are expert opinion. They're good expert opinion. For example, drug is in the same class. It probably behaves similar to another one. Some of those classes aren't even represented with a single arc. So we set about to fill in that circle. So if you take every drug against every drug and every pair of drugs against every pair of drugs, because a lot of people take hypertension drugs in pairs, and then you do all our uh, outcomes that we looked at, safety and effectiveness, about 58, you get a lot of them, many millions, most people don't take most combinations. So we had about uh, 10,000 comparisons or you know, half a million hypotheses if you include the outcome. <clears throat> the design I won't go through in detail. Basically, we want to mimic the randomized trial we would have done. So propensity score replaces the randomization we would have done. 58 outcomes of interest that are important in hypertension drugs. We kind of took the union of all the drugs that we knew. And then the negative controls here, things we think are not generally caused by hypertension drugs, and had that reviewed uh, manually by hypertension, I mean, by uh, clinicians, uh, by clinicians. Nine databases, some claims databases, some electronic health record international, including our database. So here's the class level <clears throat> results. This is for uh, myocardial infarction, the randomized trial. So these are by drug class. So I have ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, cardioselective beta blockers, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, and thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. Those are the five classes. And you look for colored squares that say it's one class is better than another. RCTs didn't separate on myocardial infarction. They do separate on composite cardiovascular, don't worry about that. If you look at legend for myocardial, we see that the, the um, beta blockers do worse. So a green square means it's better to the left, a purple square means it's better below. And it's a symmetric matrix. So the green and purple tell you the same thing in this one. What this says is the class of drugs called beta blockers is not as good as the other ones, which matches the US guideline, which says it's not. Although the European guideline puts them all as first line. It also has this odd thing in the corner that says that 
Thiazide and thiazide like diuretics are doing better than ACE inhibitors, and we're still looking into that. This is the by instead of by class by drug, the thing on the upper left, the gray thing that's mostly blank, it says the first line drugs really are tied. There's some green and purple, but that's due to Captopril, which failed its diagnostic, so we don't count it. The green square on the upper right and the purple square on the lower left, they say that first line's better than second line, which matches the guideline. And then the lower left has a mix of green and purple, and that just says the second line drugs, some are better than others. So let's look at a particular hypothesis that's, well, not controversial for most people, controversial for me, chlorothaladone versus hydrochlorothiazide. We in our study show that their effectiveness is indistinguishable, but if you look at the side effects, there's a big difference in favor of hydrochlorothiazide, things mostly related to kidneys, electrolytes, renal failure, syncope, things like that. And this paper, as I said, was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. So let's look at that a second, because it's worth diving down, like you throw out a lot of numbers. So what's the physiology? Chlorothaladone is more potent and longer lasting. We know that. More potent is probably less important because you can put more in a pill unless you reach a plateau, but longer lasting is like thought to be the big thing. The main evidence we're using, there's no head-to-head -head comparison is indirect meta-analysis. Direct meta-analysis of RCTs is our strongest evidence. Indirect meta-analysis, network meta-analysis of randomized trials is an observational study that happens to use some randomized trial results. People will say it's very strong because only, it's only a problem if your drug has different effects in different populations and also your randomized trials affect, are, are used on those different, are, were done on those different populations. But they forget that there's other bias that's only in these network meta-analyses that aren't in Odyssey's cohort studies, like, Differential randomized trial design and execution. If one trial has a lot of crossover, I'm going to get a little technical for a second, a lot of crossover, the effect size is driven towards the null. That produces spurious results when you do a network meta analysis. You can prove a drug is better than itself. That's called inconsistency if you study in network meta analysis. So I, I think it's an important tool, but it's not better than what we've been doing. If you look at the recent big observational research, they favor hydrochlorothiazide. When Dalla of Canada published his large scale study, the effect sizes were, the effects were like most identical to what we got. You should have seen the letters that came out, basically one of them saying that he needs to be cut off from Canadian research funds because he should not have a result that says that, chlor, that chlorothalin is not as good as hydrochlorothiazide. So when I published, I got letters from Tom Frieden who was trained here, head of the CDC, from the lead author of the guideline, Whalen, their concerns with things like, well, people are just failing off hydrochlorothiazide diuretic. Um, and so you're really, and, and you're comparing to chlorothaladone, it's not a fair comparison. We looked at it, we found that people were failing off chlorothaladone faster. And they're failing off both of them within two months for half the people, failing off monotherapy. They said our time at risk was too short, but 25% of them are long-term and we do have the power to detect other differences. I got lots of anecdotes from old doctors who either they or their wives have hypertension. It was always the same story. They're on hydrochlorothiazide, it didn't work well enough, they got chlorothalone, they went to renal failure. Or they got the chlorothalone renal failure first, and then they got into the failed hypertension control on hydrochlorothiazide and ended up on something else. The, our study's been taken up by like the medical letter and up to date, they still favor chlorothalone. Um, physiologically, our results can make sense. You can always make up a story. You know, your hypertension, antihypertension effect is probably integral over time. If your hypertension goes up a little bit, a little bit for the day, it probably doesn't have a huge effect on your outcomes, but your side effects are nonlinear. And if your kidney rests for two hours a day, it may be time to re-equilibrate your body. So that's the physiologic like little story you can make up. My thing is, I don't think anyone's going to convince by any evidence. And so we're going to switch to chlorothaladone. If you switch from hydrochlorothiazide to chlorothaladone, Pretend you've gone to a potent loop diuretic. Like, don't treat it as a as a not as a, as a as a safe drug. And if your patient gets a cold and gets dehydrated, they could have bad effects. So treat it as the potent drug it is. We're picking it because it's potent. Treat it as such. Oh, I forgot to say, there is a randomized trial in the VA that's going on now, but they're studying a different question. They're saying once you tolerate hydrochlorothiazide, should you switch to the more potent drug? Maybe you should. I mean, that's a different question. That doesn't mean you should start with it because you may have a bad side effect on the way there. On the other hand, when we're in agreement on the evidence, it goes a lot more smoothly. So we looked at ACE versus ARB, showed that ARBs are equally effective, probably better, but equally effective and better side effects. 
uh, published in Hypertension, taken up in JAMA Internal Medicine, um, JAMA um, News, and recently published in, in Circulation, saying it's time to make the switch, I think triggered, I think, by our study largely. So you could say, well, you generate all this evidence. There are randomized trials. How did you compare? Well, the p-value says 5% should disagree. 28 out of 30 that matched agree. So that's about 6%. So we're doing about the level of agreement with randomized trials that we ought to be. And we certainly filled in the circle of evidence shown there on the right, what Odyssey does for, uh, uh, for those arcs and published in a number of places. Now, um, we've done uh, predictive analytics. I won't go into detail. I'll just say that Odyssey's, as you can guess right now, Odyssey's main focus in predictive analytics is in reproducibility and reliability. Just to mention, because I want to talk about impact of these things, I'm going to go into COVID. I'm going to just show you some examples. Remember hydroxychloroquine? So um, back when that was being used, uh, we did a study on the safety side of it. And the European Medicines Agency, when they put forward their determination that it's time to stop using hydroxychloroquine, we were one of the two studies, Odyssey study, to in that taking it away. Hydroxychloroquine is a very safe drug, but not when you give it to hundreds of millions of people and not when you combine it with azithromycin. The FDA may have used it also, but they don't tell you how they made their decisions. The EMA tells you what they're doing. Remember, we were worried whether ACE inhibitors and ARBs would make you your COVID worse because they go through the similar channel. We were one, in, one of many who did that study, but shown there underlined in red is that the EMA, again, highlighted our study as an exemplar of reproducible research. Vaccines came out, we pivoted to vaccine safety and effectiveness. If you remember last March, uh, that week, that 13 European countries shut off AstraZeneca because of the clotting that was reported. EMA came to us. We quickly ran us. We had been working four months on how to create background rates for vaccine effectiveness, and then just so uh, safety. It just so happens then we got this question and we put it into practice, and that's the plot on the lower left. And we gave them those rates, and on the 18th they they turned AstraZeneca back on for 700 million people. So that's probably our most effective study that we've done. Gave us a letter saying, "Dear editor, please publish. Please, please peer review this quickly, and publish it." Also some fun studies. If you look at not just what we published, but others published on the, on the treatment of, <clears throat> of COVID and then see what happens in actual use of those things and seeing how things, how quickly things change based on when things are published. So we've published as of the fall about 41 studies, some in, in top journals. Coming near the end, just mention some collaborations. We're working with the FDA. We have a $10 million grant with that, with the Biologics Institute, which was to do other stuff, but has pivoted to vaccine safety and effectiveness, mainly helping them on designing the studies and they carry them out. The All of Us Research Program, of which we're a recruitment site, we're also part of the coordinating center because they adopted the Odyssey data model, common data model, as the basis of that program. Emerge Network from NIH, also similarly based on the Odyssey common data model. <clears throat> National COVID Cohort Collaborative for that, N3C is better known, also based on OMA. Europe also went with Odyssey, the Eden $30 million initiative adopted and just got a new award, uh, the Darwin EU. And countries like South Korea adopted as their national network. Um, sorry to my lab members, because I didn't get to do the other parts of our work. I'll just state that we do other work in causal inference. I showed you an epidemiologic approach. We also do structural causal models, working with Elias Barenboim and Dave Bly uh, from Columbia, my colleagues. Uh, also, um, mechanism. you can go one more than that, actually look at the physiology. So we do mechanistic models with Dave Albers and using ontologies to uh, inform all those things. Let's, a couple slides at CUMC. Where are we? Our 6 million patient database, you know you can get to it through an IRB proposal and track, but you can get to it now without any further approval because I already got approval for you from the IRB. If you go to INYP, which some of you know, which you can get to from Epic, if you do the link and not the browser, you go to the Explore tab and there sitting for you is access to our database, which you can query if you're doing, say, um, if you need uh, some data for a uh, grant proposal, you wanna know how many patients we have for every disease in our database, you can look that up right there. We want to do a learning healthcare system. I just described an, a systematic approach to doing observational research. We can do a study in a day or two that used to take a year. Why not put that into practice at the bedside? 
If I'm at the bedside, I have a patient, I have a question, it's not in the literature, can we answer your question for you right there? Our first question was, does penicillin cause angioedema? The answer is no, or at least not above average for drugs. So Anastropolitz wrote a, uh, did a pilot study of that, going to the teams. Um, the truth is most of the questions that come in, it may be triggered by a patient, but it's really a research question that they're now interested in. We did have some examples where it was actually to treat the patient. We found if it confirmed their suspicion, they were very happy to have the confirmation. If it, if it contradicted their suspicion, they said, well, I don't know how to interpret this. And finally, um, just to point out, we're going to go, for, we're going forward with the Observational Research Task Force chaired by Dawn Hirschman and by me. The membership is being confirmed as clinical researchers, epidemiology, equity, informatics, privacy, health records. They look at research themes for emphasis and faculty development, collaboration, education, linkage to the other initiatives. So in summary, current observational research is indeed suspect. We believe that large scale observational research is possible and is becoming more published. Our 6 million patient database is available for research today. And if you help us with the funding, also our market scan database. There's my funding and thank you. George, that's amazing. I mean, honestly, it's hard to imagine when I look at the COVID impact, like something that had that amount of impact. I mean, we've seen so much work come out of this community over the last few years, but it's just extraordinary. So I think we have time for a few questions. I am, as I understand, if people do have a question in the audience, it's great if you use a microphone. Um, part equity, please mind using a microphone. And then people who are on Zoom, I can see your questions. If you want to enter them in, I'm happy to moderate them. George, wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. Um, in a lot of clinical trial designs and in other areas, Bayesian models and Bayesian frameworks are being used for kind of prior knowledge and prior experience. So I didn't hear you talk about any of that aspect in terms of the data sets. Maybe because you don't need to have a Bayesian approach to give it the, 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 the sample sizes, but how do you approach that? Like the doc actually knows something or the prior knowledge. Sure thing. So actually the work we're doing for the FDA is in fact bringing a Bayesian approach to um, vaccine surveillance. So it's precisely that. I didn't want to get too technical for too long within the talk. Um, yeah, our methods are frequent, our large scale methods where you have 100 million patients in your database and 100,000 variables, you know, you have to be very efficient. We can't use R or Python or something to do this. We actually had to write our own code in C, which is openly available to do lasso regression when you have 100 million patients by 100,000 variables. So that's frequentist. But the work we're doing with the FDA is in fact Bayesian. In fact, everyone who's doing, who's inventing these frequentist methods are actually Bayesian researchers like um, Mark Souchard at UCLA and actually our own David Madigan, who's now at um, Northeastern, but uh, yeah. So it's Bayesian approach is right. Now we're not doing a lot of work. We're using the Bayesian approach more to like organize everything. We're not doing a lot of incorporation of previous knowledge from the literature into it yet, but that would then be an easy addition to it with the priors. We're mostly using uninformative priors. So I'm going to take the liberty. I have like a thousand questions. So I'll give myself two. Does that sound okay to everybody? And then if anybody else wants to get up. So one of the questions that's come up, George, a lot is the ability to use these types of databases also to triangulate from hypotheses that might be coming from the lab. So where somebody has a hypothesis that has come out from some mechanistic study where you think there might be a link Obviously, when we end up with, you know, the ability to think about genomics in these databases, it gets even more powerful. But even in the observation, I was thinking about the metformin example, lots of biological hypotheses about how metformin works, what it's actually going on. Have you been able to build those collaborations with people maybe thinking about the mechanistic sides? And are there ways to think about doing that? Well, first, we would love to. We... Um... You know, you can look at a, a few things. Some of us more through our eMERGE work on that yeah. project. Um, well, first of all, sometimes we have the genomics and that's part of what happens in eMERGE. But the other thing we can do is find surrogates for the genomics and link that together. And um, then it's just being clever. And if not that, so in other words, what I'm saying is uh, two patients have the same nominal disease, but they have different symptomatology. 
which leads you to conclude that there's something different in their physiology underneath it. And then you can do a study on that. So you're kind of using a surrogate. Uh, the third thing is to just come up with clever clinical hypotheses, yeah. you know, that would test it and we do the best we can there. No, I'd love to see ways we could support that. I think it's such a powerful way to think about linking the basic science to look at these. Um, I'll let you have my second for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Can, can you use this type of analysis to look at issues of healthcare disparities or selective prescribing of one drug versus another? And similarly, how much does the financial cost of the drug impact our utilization? Well, that's a good question. So there is an actually an Odyssey work group is on equity and Noemi's co-chair, Noemi Elfadad is co-chair of it, in fact. Uh, so we are working hard on that. We haven't looked at that particular question of um, the cost of the drugs, but my lab has been looking at equity. We're looking at um, uh, in, in, in renal disease, Lin Ying Zhang. Fantastic. Amazing uh, work, if you, you know that. That's, Thank you. Uh, um, a quick question. Sometimes, have you thought about sometimes on purpose, not using the full um, consortium of data sets and looking at generalizability versus specificity in terms of, for example, certain populations and even using them as controls? So yes, yeah, so, I mean, in an effect, that's what we're doing when we do the multi, so, okay. Very important feature is that we don't pool our data and then analyze it. We do a separate study in each large yeah. collection that makes sense and trying to be as you know within that to the degree possible homogeneous and then combine the answers or not combine them because our meta-analysis shows that we shouldn't and we need to come up with an explanation of why they're different so the fact that we have six million here and six million there and 100 million there allows us to do a study in each of them and then compare the results uh, among them so we're kind of doing like a review article every time we do one of our studies Fantastic uh, work, and thanks so much for the excellent talk. Um, so, as you you know, with with very large data, as you're talking about with Odyssey, obviously the reproducibility gets fantastic. But I was wondering if you could say a couple of words about limitations um, for the phar pharmacoepi in the clinical context that you're talking about. It's so fantastic. Um, but as we start to get into mechanistic uh, hypotheses, perhaps, and uh, have to think about issues of collider biases where the population you're studying is predominantly drawn from a medical center, how you are, are starting to approach uh, those factors and where there are specific, you've highlighted specific strengths here, but also uh, where, where is this, these techniques like to get into trouble? Okay, very good, thank you. Um, first of all, first weakness is if it hasn't been used a lot yet, I can't do anything with it. <laughs> so that's the first obvious um, thing. Um, Second, yes. I mean, the one example I can find of M bias is, in fact, exactly the example you gave, where people are either hospitalized or operated on for one thing or another thing. And so, if you know you have one, you don't have the other. And that's where we get this collider bias despite doing pre uh, treatment. The challenge with some of the mechanistic studies, it's not so easy to come up with 100 other hypotheses that I can get the operating characteristics because it's very fine tuned for that one. So I can't practice the usual Odyssey approach with it, but if I could, then I would say I'm gonna use the operating characteristics by studying many mechanisms, including some that I believe to be um, negative controls. But often in that kind of work, it's not so easy, like we're at pharmacoepi, I have a lot of side effects and a lot of drugs, I can always throw more stuff in. So I think that's a limitation also. Um, I think, you know, the basic principles of openness and verification though, do apply. And so we may need to modify approaches uh, because of it, but I think pre-specified protocols, you know, all the way through publishing thing, everything you go, but, and that's the easy part, maybe easy to understand, even though it's hard to get people to do it. Um, but verific um, verification, what diagnostics do you use? I think there'll be people, hopefully people from other fields who are doing that kind of work will invent their own diagnostics that make more sense for that kind of study. We have two questions I'm going to end with here online, and then I think I'll invite everybody to join us. There's so many applications that are running through my head, but these are some fairly specific questions. One is about just managing the computational burden, I guess we could say, and how do you do that? Is it in a cloud service? Is it in some other? And then I'll, I'll double barrel this quickly so you can do both. 
The other question is also specific, it asks about EPIC's research using their Cosmos database and where you think about that. So the analytic power, where's that coming from and how about Cosmos? So analytic power, we tend to use, we, we tend, we, we can move on the, on, on the cloud when we're ready, but right now it's mostly servers um, that are um, at, for example, different companies or different collaborators um, who will run the study for us. As I said, we had to write our own source code yeah. to do the analyses just to get it to run. And some of the hypertension study took, I think, two or three months to run on a server that I can't afford. <laughs> yeah, me so neither, today. just, you know. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> um, and then the, the second question was, oh, Cosmos. Yeah. So actually, so we were in conversation with Epic. You know, they're not because uh, you could look at Cosmos as another way to do it. Um, they're not very open is the problem, so it's hard yeah. to get the reliability and reproducibility from that network. Um, as an institution, I don't want to say what we're doing exactly because we're kind of deciding, but we may be part of Cosmos going forward. Epic would very much like us to be. It's hard to run Odyssey studies on that. You have to kind of do a traditional approach, yeah. uh, but we like having access to the data and we can bring in some parts of what we do into that. Um, so we're not formally, I think, as an as an NYP with Columbia and Cornell part of Cosmos yet, but we'll see how that goes as we move forward on shared services, which may, some of you will know what that means. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I just want to thank you, Dr. George, incredible talk. We're so incredibly lucky to have you doing this. So thank you so very much and congratulations. And I do think we have, is that right? As I understand it, we have a reception outside where I'd be delighted. I'd also just be great to meet people. So for those of you I haven't met, I hope I get a chance to meet you outside and we can share some refreshments. Thank you all so much for coming and for everybody online.